Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar on pedaling pains, the truth about common cycling pains and injuries and what to do. My name is James Coates, I'm the program assistant for the Bike to Work Society, filling in for Justine today and um, I'm pleased to be joined by Evan Thomas who's a physiotherapist and co-owner of Dockside Physio. You, uh, those returning from previous webinars right, might remember Evan from his presentation from all angles and today he's going to continue what we built on then in talking about pedaling pains and common cycling injuries. So we originally began these webinars to adapt our bike skills programs to the pandemic and um, we're pleased to continue them today. So a little bit about Evan. Evan is a physiotherapist. He's the co-owner of Dockside Physio and he's currently working on his coaching certification through Cycling BC and he's excited to continue supporting and growing with the cycling community in Victoria uh, today with our webinar. So a few housekeeping items, which those who have attended previous webinars will be familiar with. Uh, the presentation itself will last around 40 to 50 minutes to allow time for questions at the end before 12 o'clock. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, I encourage you to type them in the question box, which is on the control panel on the right hand side and then we can get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, I encourage you to close the program and just reopen it with the link in your email that you originally got here with, and that seems to work most of the time. Um, and for those just joining us now, a welcome to the webinar on pedaling pains, the truth about common cycling pains and injuries. My name is James Coates, and I'm joined by physiotherapist Evan Thomas. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Evan for your presentation. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks, James. Um, so I'm just going to make sure I can get my stuff out of the way here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so thanks for taking the time out of your morning, guys, to uh, to join us here for the webinar. Um, yeah, some of this, if you attended the, the previous one that I did uh, with the Bike to Work Society, um, there is some similarities to it. There'll be some, um, um, some kind of building on kind of previous concept with things. So there's like a tiny bit of overlap, but for the most part, things are more focused on like the injury sorts of stuff where the other one was more um, specific to the fitting, but the two go hand in hand. So they'll kind of feed off each other there a little bit for sure but um yeah just kind of quickly um i'm sure my thing's going here yeah sorry i'm running two computers at the same time <laughs> so um yeah so just a little bit a little bit about me so i yeah i did my um undergrad in kinesiology at uh, the university of victoria here in town obviously and uh and before that i kind of got my first bike got a cyclocross bike kind of really leapt into um some biking stuff with a buddy of mine and we had some good wipeouts together and all that sort of stuff. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun to kind of start out with. And then uh, yeah, I moved out to Ontario to do my uh, physiotherapy degree um, out at Western. And uh, um, it was too expensive for me at the time to kind of bring my bike out there with me. So I just bought a different bike. And it happened to be actually pretty much the same thing, just a newer model. And then uh, and then moved back out here. I went, met my wife in school and uh, moved back out here and. Uh, kind of was getting into more of the bike stuff and I uh, came across um, a guy in, in Vancouver, North Vancouver called uh, Dave Howells, who's one of the bike fit instructors in, in the country and uh, took a course with him and, and uh, walked away with more more questions than answers and that's just really how things go, which is, which is good. And, uh, and so then we, um, me and my wife opened up our own clinic um, later, kind of near the end of 2017 and uh, now I have kind of like more of like a dedicated bike fitting room, which is which is great. And then we had a kid uh, soon after we opened, so really crazy time for us, that's for sure. And then uh, and then um, kind of later on um, at the uh, end of last year, I got my uh, orthopedics um, advanced diploma um, through our physio association. And then right before COVID, I bought a new bike, and we closed the clinic two days after I got it. So my wife wasn't too happy that I bought a new bike, but I got a really awesome deal off of guys. So, um, so yeah, and I've been using it a ton, as I'm sure a lot of people are right now, just to kind of get outside, even if uh, initially on our by ourselves there. But uh, slowly, our groups have been expanding, so that's good. But, uh, but yeah, so that's a little bit. That's just a little bit about me there on that one. So, um, I'll just kind of dive right into the to the injury stuff. So there's 
there's a few different uh, different kinds of there. They've kind of grouped them into kind of like non-traumatic and traumatic sort of categories. So non-traumatic would be stuff where obviously there's no trauma, so there was no wasn't any impact or falls or that sort of thing. So that's split into um, kind of contact, um, which just means that the yeah the points that you make with the bike can get a bit sore. So like saddles a good example or hands. Um, there's also overuse, which would be um, more kind of like repetitive um, sorts of injuries that can come about just from either the position or the cycling motion itself. And then of course there's other category which is traumatic, which um, we won't. Uh, I don't have time to touch too much on on that one there with it. Um, that one's definitely a bit more um, uh, kind of specific and uh, to the person, depending on kind of what the injury was and what their limitations are and stuff. So. Um, I'll kind of leave that one out for, for right now, but uh, maybe we'll come up with another webinar potentially down the road on that. But um, but yeah, so um, so talking about the, the types of cycling injuries, like I said, so we kind of talked about contact for starters. So yeah, where the pain points, where the where the your body kind of interfaces with the bike, um, and there's there's these kind of three general categories. There's neuropathies, which um, is a general term for any sort of like nerve um, kind of issue, whether it's pain or numbness or tingling or um, lack of power and that sort of thing. But usually with cycling, it, it's a bit more like a like a soreness or like a kind of tingly numb feeling. Um, and then there's also saddle pains, and sometimes in, in cases if it's bad enough, it could be saddle sores. Um, and then there can be um, kind of um, other sorts of things like kind of like pain kind of through the groin or kind of perineal area. Um, and sometimes with enough compression, um, there, there can be some vascular issues or, or um, um, again, some nerve issues kind of uh, down there <laughs> as well. So um, there has been a bit of a spike actually with, uh, with saddle sores and that sort of thing right now during COVID because a lot of people have been biking it indoors. And so um, yeah, obviously inside, there's not as much airflow. So um, you don't keep yourself cool. Um, everywhere <laughs> while you're kind of sitting kind of stationary so they've been really encouraging people to use fans to blow on them um, while they're riding away there um, to kind of uh, kind of cool themselves down which can be really helpful to keep to keep everything dry um, and uh, and uh, um, yeah prevent chafing and that sort of thing so um, obviously outside things have been kind of opening back up so we've been outdoors more which is great so it's becoming less of an issue again which is great but uh, um, that's pretty much yeah um, main thing I kind of have to say with that one but uh, but yeah so there's lots of things that have been kind of been coming about um, over the last little bit for sure but we're getting it sorted out so um, on the last uh, webinar uh, we kind of talked about like, obviously the main points of contact with the bike are your hands your seat and your feet and all these kind of feed off each other to kind of support and disperse the weight um, on your on your bike and so we can kind of take advantage of that sort of concept depending on where the soreness is either we can shift weight away or um, to other areas or we can put weight onto it to offload offload others so it's kind of this kind of fine balance that we can play around with um, yeah and so um, so in that contact injury um, kind of slide so the first one we were kind of talking about with it was the neuropathy end of things so if we talk about the really common one would be like a they call like a cyclist palsy or like a handlebar palsy and what that is is that we have a nerve that kind of runs through this part of our hand, um, which all part of our ulnar nerve that kind of comes all the way up here from the funny bone, and it uh, kind of passes through this uh, region called the Guillain's tunnel. Um, and what can happen is that um, because a lot of us kind of put pressure on our hands in that spot, especially if you have like the drop bars or the hoods on your bike, um, it can be quite achy after a while if you stay in that position for too for too long. And sometimes that can be a bit intensified if you're, especially if you're going off of like kind of really bumpy roads and kind of rougher sorts of terrain. So um, I'm not sure if that's why on some of the gravel bikes, they've made the handlebars a bit more flared. Um, I think that, I mean, it's good for handling, but I think that's also kind of maybe helps with some of that to some extent because it is more bumpy for sure. But uh, um, but that is like a really common pressure point um, for people. And sometimes if if the fitting of the bike's a bit off um, with regards to handlebars, like if they're if they're too wide, especially, um, people can kind of like fall into this kind of a wrist extended position. And, and now you're doing kind of a bit of a, um, not a double whammy, but you're kind of doing two things to that area. So you're, you're putting a bit of pressure on the nerve, plus you're putting a bit of stretch on it there too. So uh, the two together can sometimes 
be a, con a compounding effect and then it can get really really quite sore and and um and i just want to be clear people you're definitely not like you're not causing nerve damage or any of that sort of stuff but it can definitely get pressure sensitive after a while and so we just want to think about ways to kind of like uh, mitigate that as best we can just to give the nerve a good environment to uh to heal back up and get some more uh, breathing room around it um so it's yeah not damaging but it can definitely be super annoying a lot of people ride and shake their hands out that sort of thing so um that's into here that we should probably do something about that um so um this sounds super simplistic but um one of the best things you can do is actually just um keep keep changing up the position there on the bike um for for any of us if we kind of hang out in that position it can get really quite uncomfortable um on the hands so it's always good to kind of mix it up between the two so obviously people um everybody has different kinds of bikes so if you're kind of more like a road style bike just kind of playing around with those three positions if that's comfortable on the rest of your body because um different hand positions will dictate kind of how far you're leaning forwards or how upright you are so but just kind of mixing it up is key for sure just to kind of um give that spot a bit of breathing space for sure and then if you have more of the um uh more kind of like the flat bars on your bike um if you're more like, like a mountain bike or a hybrid bike um, again same story concept variation uh position is key and one thing you can do with the flat bars is that you can get uh, i'm not saying you necessarily have to get these thingies <laughs> i found that on, on on ebay but i know some people in the city that have this sort of thing but um on a road bike you can't do this but on on a hybrid bike uh you can get different grips for it and uh, you can kind of see they have a bit of a flare um to them to some extent um kind of around this this zone here so what that allows for is um this greater kind of surface area so you can make uh, you can kind of disperse some of your force through your hand uh through more of it as opposed to just having like very kind of pointed um pressure there on it and that can be really helpful actually for a lot of people too so it's still putting pressure on the area but it's just over a larger space and it's less less focused um for sure and that can make uh, again that can make the nerve happier on that um yeah um and then um some other things you can kind of play around with too so in addition to kind of um changing up hand position on the bike um of course you can also um play around with some of the bike um position there on it too so either you can lower the saddle height a little bit which will put um less lean onto the handlebars and a bit more weight onto the onto your seat um you can raise the saddle nose put a star next to that one <laughs> um because you want to be mindful of that but you can raise the nose of the saddle up a little bit uh, because sometimes if it's too far down people will slide forwards as they go and uh, gradually put more pressure on their hands so um i wouldn't suggest to kind of ride with the nose or the saddle kind of higher than like level like zero degrees um uh, usually you want to be in that one to three degree downward downward tilt with things but um yeah you definitely don't want to go up the other way because that will cause um, some saddle issues that we were just kind of talking uh, a moment ago about. So, um, yeah. So if you do have some wiggle room, you could you could try that if it's really kind of far down. Like some people, I'll see you're riding with like six degrees down. So if you bring that up a bit, that could still be safe and make quite a difference. Um, and then of course you can raise the bar height, getting putting less pressure on your hands, more onto your seat. And then you can also move the saddle forwards, which would be um, again putting a little bit more pressure on the saddle um and because it's going to be making you like a little bit more upright so all those sorts of things pretty much uh in a nutshell just means taking pressure off the hands a bit and putting it elsewhere as long as it doesn't make those other areas that you're shifting to uh sort um this one <laughs> i kind of found this one um late last night and i'm like okay yeah i guess that's i guess that could work there too as an option i was kind of trying to think outside the box on some other ideas so uh, yeah, some places, uh, some of the some of the cycling magazines out there have suggested to people that hey, actually, you know, you could let some of the air out of your tires. Um, some people ride uh, with a, a ton of pressure in them, so obviously with that, there's more um, kind of road vibration with it. So if you soften the tires a bit, that might be able to help out there with it too. Um, so I'll I'll leave, I'll leave that one up to you guys about how 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 uh, um, pressurized you want to you want to have those tires to be there. But uh, yeah. Um, that's a that's a preference on that one for sure if it was too low you'll feel like you're riding through peanut butter or something really something really soggy so <laughs> so you want to find that right balance 
Um, so if we go down to the other end of the body, um, in terms of neuropathy stuff, uh, we can have the, uh, obviously the, there's our feet and they have a bunch of nerves that kind of flow through, uh, through the, um, the plantar aspect or through the arch of the foot, um, obviously really similar to our hands. And so people can also get um, tangling um, in their, in their forefoot, so kind of underneath like the, um, underneath kind of like the, the, the ball of the foot sort of thing. And then you can also get, um, the other option would be is you'd be getting, if you're further onto the toes with the pedal, then you get some numbness and tingling in those areas. So um, again, that's due to just having a bit of prolonged pressure being uh, placed on these issues. But um, it is actually, even though I can feel like it, and same with, same with the hands, um, it's very rarely like a circulation problem. Um, I know that's a concern to a lot of people and I, and I, and I totally get it because I'm not, like tingling can kind of be like, oh God, like my arm's falling asleep, like I'm cutting off blood flow. And there can be, you can be cutting off blood flow to the nerves a little bit, which is why you're getting some like that tingling sensation, but you're not, um, you're not cutting off so much blood flow that you're, um, you know, having an impact on like the, like your tissue health or like you're going to, um, you know, uh, cause damage to the muscles and all that sort of thing there with the two. But um, you'd have to have a significant amount of pressure or some other um, kind of underlying um, health conditions um, that obviously you'd want to get screened for and stuff with your with your healthcare provider. But um, usually this is a case where the nerves are just, they're letting you know with the tingles that they've had enough and they, they, need, they need to change. Um, and so for, uh, for uh, kind of building on top of uh, the previous um, webinar that uh, we did together, um, so if people are getting a bit more pressure um, on the inside of their foot and they're getting a bit of um, numbness and tingling, in addition to that, then that's definitely a good indicator that, hey, you should be probably changing up the foot position there a little bit on it. So um, we talked about before, if you're getting a bit of discomfort on the inside of the foot, then what you want to do is um, you want to move your shoe, in most cases, um, kind of in towards the crank arm or in towards the bike. Um, you can also put a little bit of like a wedge between the um, the shoe and the actual cleat itself to kind of um, to bring to bring the knee out a little bit and again kind of shift weight more to the outside of the foot um, and also to if obviously if you don't ride clipped in which is totally fine then the other option would be um, sometimes people can get some insoles or inserts into their shoes. Um, to kind of help with that too, and that can improve um, again pressure distribution through the through the front of the foot, so it's not so much um, just on one aspect of it. And then of course it can go the other way there with the two, so you can have um, a bit of pressure on the opposite side of the foot, um, and same sort of principle. So just kind of changing the foot position. So in this case, you want to move the foot um, outwards to get it more underneath the knee. And then that can even out the pressure through the front of the foot. Um, and again, you could do um, a, a wedge there as well to some extent, or an insole, um, or even a little bit of both. So again, that just um, um, again coming all all comes down to pressure distribution pretty much. But that can be the biggest thing. Or in terms of um, where you place your foot, if you're not clipped in, where you actually place your foot on the pedals there with the two, so you could play around with some of that as well until you find like a like a good spot for it. Um, and uh, um, in, in addition to kind of talking about like different pressures on the sides of the foot or the inside of the foot, if you do find that you are getting a bit of kind of numbness or tingling into the toes, um, that might be a case where, again, going back to our last webinar there, that the spindle of the, of the pedal, pedal um, might be too much uh, towards the toes. And so in that case, what you want to do is you want to actually move your foot further forward onto the pedal um, so that again you get that pressure going right through the forefoot and less on the toes. Um, yeah pretty much all I gotta say on that one. Um, and we already kind of talked about some insoles so that's definitely a possibility. Um, it depends on your footwear like if you're, if you're riding more with the flat pedals um, obviously you have a lot more options for different kind of shoes you can wear. If you're riding with more um, kind of clipped in cell sort of stuff usually the shoes are quite uh, quite rigid for the most part, um, unless you have some different kind of mountain bike shoes. But uh, um, with that one, you definitely want to make sure that uh, the biggest thing is that you have a good fit to your shoe, because um, sometimes people will be having numbness because their foot is in a shoe that's 
far too narrow for them and that's causing the numbness and tingling because of the compression they're on. So um, hunting around for a good pair of shoes uh, is definitely can be definitely really helpful there for it for sure. Yeah, so that would be uh, another good option there for you too. Yeah. Um, if we go up from the pedals <laughs> towards the towards the saddle, um, again, this is something that we talked touched on from the last webinar. So um, if people are riding more in kind of like a like a leisure sort of like commuter sort of bike position, then um, as you can kind of see on the uh, on the pressure diagram here, most of the weight is actually it's going through. Um, the whole part of the saddle a bit more definitely on those little hot spots there um, which is where the our sit bones are positioned there on it and then the further you kind of lean forwards um, the more you actually end up getting away from your sit bones um, to the point where you're doing like you know the time trial sort of position where you're, you're more so kind of on like the edge of the uh, like on the nose of the seat and so um, most people uh, um, are kind of riding somewhere in this sort of region um, which makes sense because as you can kind of see, um, I just kind of did this little diagram here to kind of highlight it. Um, it's, it's all about, again, from what we've been mentioning before, kind of like some pressure pressure trade-offs. So obviously most of the pressure's on the saddle here, there's less on the hands. Um, and as you kind of go in this direction, there's less and less pressure on, this, on the seat and more towards your hands or your arms. So some people find that, um, this can be the most comfortable position there for them, kind of meeting somewhere in between, um, which in terms of like performance and cycling efficiency and that sort of thing, um, that's also a good position to be in there with it too, in terms of being able to kind of um, put the hammer down and put in some good power in, into the pedals and, and be comfortable while you're doing it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but again, it all depends on, depends on the position that you need for sure in terms of where the discomfort is. So but that's kind of generally the, the two are kind of inversely related to each other with the uh, with the seat and the hand pressure. Yeah. Um, in terms of, <laughs> kind of a funny looking thing, in terms of um, the, uh, the saddle itself, so obviously we can talk about putting pressure on and off the saddle, but if the saddle is the problem in the first place, then that is something you definitely want to address on it. So um, this is an example of a tool that Specialized has. Um, I'm pretty sure um, one of the shop, a couple of shops in Victoria have something that, that's similar to this, um, but you pretty much just kind of um, sit your butt down on this uh, gel thing and uh, you just kind of sit there for a few moments and once you kind of stand up, then they just obviously kind of take a measurement of uh, like how, uh, what the distance is between the two sit bone points. Um, so that would be kind of one way to do it. If you want to do a little more, uh, do it yourself. Um, this is something we talked about before too, in the previous webinar where, um, you can just find yourself like a firm surface and a piece of corrugated cardboard, and you can just, um, put your butt on there and kind of maybe not, I wouldn't wiggle around, but maybe kind of just do a couple little bounces there on it, just straight up and down, and then look at the pressure points there and then just mark an X. Um, roughly in the center of the of the indentation, and then do the measurement between the two points that way. So um, that can be just as just as effective for sure. And it's uh, it's not it's not perfect. Um, you definitely want to take into consideration um, uh, obviously the, the, like the saddle shape itself. So you can go in there with the measurements, and um, they can find the saddle that that meets those requirements. But um, you really won't know until obviously you put on your bike and kind of try it out. So I definitely encourage people to, once they know what they're, what the measurement is, just to go and, and try some saddles out there. Um, and, uh, then you'll get a good sense of how you feel, how stable you are on the, on the, on the seat. If it's hitting you in funny spots and that sort of thing, um, then you want to know. <laughs> so you totally can't hang your head on this one, but it can be a good starting point. Um, and on that topic of rocking hips, um, Again, I don't know why I thought this was funny late at, late at night. Um, I'm a bit sleep deprived right now because we're two and a half year old. <laughs> but uh, so people can have um, this would be a case where if the uh, if people are having saddle pains or saddle sores because they're rubbing on the saddle is because their hips are doing too much of a crazy kind of rocking back and forth motion. Um, so in this case, what uh, what you want to do is uh, in most cases get a seat that's a little bit wider so you're not tipping over the edge of the saddle. 
and so your butt's a bit more firmly planted on it. Um, and sometimes you'll see people, um, if you look at them from behind, they're they're rocking, but they only rock in one direction. And um, there's a few things that can be a contributing factor to that. Um, but uh, a common one would be um, people can have like a little bit of like a leg length difference, and so they're actually reaching more for that pedal on the one side. And so uh, putting in a little um, shim into the mix there um, can help bring up the foot a bit higher and you get less of that reach and then you'll see the hips stable, uh, stabilize a bit more with that. Um, yeah, and of course that'll make the, uh, the saddle sores um, or soreness in that spot uh, um, eventually kind of dissipate for sure, less friction on that zone. Um, if we, so that's kind of the, um, the contact sorts of injuries in a nutshell. So the next one um, in that list was the overuse. So these are more kind of like re repetitive sorts of injuries. And they can uh, they can be associated with contact injuries for sure, depending on um, the the uh, the position of the person on the bicycle, and if there's any kind of um, soreness that's already there from the pressure, and then you get an, an, a repetitive motion on top of that. But uh, generally, with, with the overuse, um, there's the, the common ones would be any sort of like spinal pain, so kind of like neck and lower back are pretty common. Um, especially like uh, and, and knee pains in the mixer with the two. The other three um, is uh, one of them is greater Turk and Carrick pain syndrome. Um, everything has a syndrome name associated with it, but um, another name for it is uh, like a like a proximal or like a like a higher up um, IT band uh, sort of pain. And um, so that's a that's a whole other topic. Um, to kind of get into discussion there about with it, but uh, um, and same with IT band stuff there in general, um, as well as a, like an Achilles sort of pain there with it as well. So uh, for for this webinar, I just kind of focus mostly on the on the neck and lower back because those are definitely really common ones, as well as the knee pain. And if you look in the literature, those are the ones that are definitely talked about um, the most often. And so we'll just kind of keep our focus on those. But um, like I said, maybe on another webinar we'll get into the other guys. So. Um, sorry if you are having these other three <laughs> issues on your bike and we're not touching on them, but uh, um, I'll have my email there at, at the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions, totally feel free to uh, to fire them my way um, since we're not talking about them. But um, yeah, I'd be happy to give you some info. So for the neck pain, um, there uh, this can be due to um, just having a bit of increased pressure um, of the joints on the back of the spine, so like the, the facet joints, um, which kind of kind of guide and dictate how we move and tilt side to side and that sort of thing. Um, it can also be from pressure on like the nerves themselves, um, and um, as well as kind of prolonged use of actually just the muscles <clears throat> on the back side of our neck there with the two. So, you know, our heads are heavy-ish sorts of things, so uh, <laughs> which is good. Um, and so, but there is a bit more effort in the uh, in those muscles for such a long period of time. If you're bent forward, to kind of hold the head up, and sometimes the muscles can get a bit sore with that. So, um, those are some few common ones on that. And if you and if you think about it, um, if you just kind of flip the cycling position there around a little bit, um, how you're kind of bent forward is looking up. It's kind of similar to just like if you were to look up overhead for a while there with it as well. So, um, um, a good example of that would be is if you're like painting the ceiling which I did in, in parts of this house and that's really sucked after a while, or even just doing stuff where you're like, you know, doing some trimming on the trees and that sort of stuff. And you kind of like in that prolonged position there with the, um, uh, you're, 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 you're kind of doing the same sort of, sort of mechanism there to it. So again, not, not damaging yourself um, by any means, but it's just the pressure over time gets a bit sore. Um, some people, if they do have any kind of like arthritic changes in their neck, um, this can be a really provoking, um, position depending on where the arthritis is kind of situated but um, if it's really acutely, acutely flared up um, then you want to think about some other positions uh, for these people or for yourself even to kind of help uh, change some of that pressure so whether um, yeah change like the hand position um, or um, again kind of like lowering the seat down potentially over the two just anything to kind of bring you a bit more upright um, can definitely make things a lot more comfortable for sure yeah and then obviously as things start to kind of feel like they're resolving and the, and the pain's dissipating, if it is acutely flared up, then you can kind of 
um, sway back to the position that you're in before if that's the one you want to be in for sure. So um, there's there's ways around it. I'm always really hopeful for people with their recoveries. So um, um, yeah, there's always there always there are always ways around it to kind of modify stuff. I never like taking things away from people, especially things they really love and enjoy doing. And there's lots of cyclists in Victoria that really are super passionate about it, which is awesome. So um, we, yeah, you always want to think about ways to kind of keep yourself moving, but just uh, just just change things up, even if, if it's just temporary, um, can make a big difference. And then yeah, change it back when you're better. So for um, so for the neck, uh, um, since you're kind of in for the most part, um, if people are kind of on their bikes, they're kind of leaning forwards, kind of looking up. Um, then some stuff that you can do while you're on the bike is you can kind of change your hand position so you're a bit upright, or if you're super brave, uh, you can take your hands off the bars and just kind of roll down the road more upright. And uh, you can kind of do some chin tucks. So again, just kind of doing a position that um, if we're like this, just doing something that's just totally opposite to it, and just um, take a little bit of um, workload off these guys and just give them like some gentle stretching motions there to it, just like switch it up, as well as take a little bit of pressure off the neck there too. Um, and it also helps kind of take a bit of um, prolonged tension off the front of the neck as well. So that can be a good little good little trick. And then if you're off the bike, um, a good example would be um, just if you have a foam roller or even just like a towel roll, um, and you can kind of do some rolling on the back to um, indirectly help out the neck, but just kind of working the upper back in an opposite direction. Um, and uh, um, just to get it more of an extended position after being flexed for a while. And that, since your neck's situated obviously right on top of your upper back, um, that can have a good effect on the, on the neck there with it too, because you'll you'll feel a bit more upright with things. So those are some quick and easy things you can do for that. And again, there's so much stuff to talk about with this. Uh, yeah, we could easily make a, a purely dedicated exercise um, webinar on that one. So, but I'll leave it there for right now. Um, then in the, the, for, for the, um, this sort of slide here, um, what I was trying to demonstrate was that uh, it doesn't always come down to fitting. Like lots of times people actually are, are pretty good, actually. The, the, the setup's pretty nice. Um, there's just a few little things to kind of tweak. So um, if, if you are kind of having some neck and sort of shoulder pain, even just paying attention to what you're doing on the bike and just um, can have a big impact um, in a good way on things over the two. So um, a lot of us have our habits in terms of how we move and how we sit um or stand that sort of stuff and sometimes it's kind of taking stock of like oh actually like what am i okay i'm feeling some tension in my neck and shoulders like what am i doing here maybe i'll kind of play around with some stuff and so i um the 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 image on the left is something that can be can be i commonly see out there when i'm on i'm on the road through the right really kind of riding up high and uh and with their arms kind of locked out and so obviously with that locked out arm position um, you can get a bit more kind of road vibration and if you're shrugging up your shoulders for long enough that'll be get a bit sore through there too so the the two things can kind of compound and um, create some discomfort for people so um this sounds very meditative kind of relax and accept and that sort of thing but it's it's kind of there's definitely some truth to it for sure so if you're if you kind of relax the shoulders down um as you can kind of see it'll also help with a bit of um, upper back posture there with the two it'll kind of flatten you out a tad but if you relax the shoulders down from there um and uh, oh sorry i was like wondering what these things were so if you relax down from there um you'll actually see that uh, yeah you'll be a little bit less kind of bunched up through here less muscle um activation over an extended period of time so that can um, help with some of the tension in the area too and then obviously with a bit of a bend in the elbows there um, you can absorb some of the road vibration a bit more as well so um, those are some, that's a really quick and simple thing that you can kind of try out there at home if you, if you do find maybe that you are kind of riding a bit um, shrugged up and elbows locked and sort of thing and, and see if that makes a difference. Um, for kind of going down the spine to the to the lower back, um, this is actually, <laughs> low back pain is uh, really prevalent and it's kind of in all parts of, of society for sure for, for a number of different reasons. but um, this is definitely an area that I think um, um, gets the most attention um, in musculoskeletal care, and uh, definitely gets a lot of attention in the in the cycling world there with it too. So um, it's actually kind of interesting if you if you look at club level cyclists, um, most of them are riding around with a pretty decent amount of back pain, but they just kind of suck it up and just keep going through it for sure. So. 
um, which is good. I mean, you want, I mean, you want to listen to it for sure, but um, um, and, and probably address some of those certain things. But in most cases, it's not, it's uh, the back is just tired of being in that position, and it's nothing, no sinister pathology and stuff going on. But um, yeah, um, we don't want to sacrifice what we do. We're we're a tough bunch, <laughs> so um so uh but definitely um yeah a lot of people do um yeah it, it, it all kind of areas of cycling um lower back pain is a, is a big issue so um this is um this is just one um kind of literature review paper um from geez about like 10 years ago now um and uh they some of the stuff that comes out is, is really interesting and actually meets up well with the pain science information that we've been getting over recent years there with the two and this was just highlighting the fact that if you're looking um from a from a pathomechanical, which just means like a um, like a mechanical error, or um, um, purely just looking at it from like a, um, a tissue loading perspective only, um, there's actually um, not a lot of evidence behind that as a standalone thing. There's lots of things that play into low back pain and that sort of stuff, but um, just purely just relying on um, position and um that sort of thing as a as a predictor for people's pain you actually really can't say that even though we've talked about all these amazing things <laughs> in the webinar um just by looking at somebody's back and, and saying like oh yeah you're a bit ran through there that's why you're having pain um it's not it's not as simple as that um but there is some things that they did find um in in this research where um they did they did find that it was helpful though to um, change the tilt of the saddle um, and uh, I'm sorry I'm blanking on anything here so it kind of changed the yeah, tilt of the saddle there and whew, sorry brain is definitely having a fart on me right now um, uh, yeah tilting the saddle and kind of changing around just, just pretty much like how you're positioned through the lower back so anything that's creating um, a bit of a um, like a backward tilt or roll of the of the pelvis puts more tension on um, from the sacrum up through the lower back. So um, they, I mean they did they did find in the research that that was a common theme in a lot of people that did have low back pain, but it wasn't predictive of low back pain, which is a bit confusing. But um, it's just saying that it's it's a common theme that they that they found. So uh, that that one had the had the wide, highest level of um, evidence for it. So level one evidence. So it just means that they did like a big systematic review or meta analysis of randomized controlled uh, trials, which are kind of like the the higher quality trials, and um, that can be that can be done there. So there there is definitely more clout to this one. Um, and the other levels of evidence, like they're they're still good, but um, um, the, the the best one is the, is the level one evidence for this sort of stuff. And so um, they did they did find that um, pelvis position was was a, was a strong factor for sure, um, but not predictive. <laughs> so for the um, so, they, so like I was kind of saying there already there um, that the yeah prolonged flex posture can contribute to the lower back pain as they may be putting a bit of um, stretch on active and passive structures so the muscles and ligaments and stuff that like will go through the lower back so if you want to optimize the position then you want to pay attention to the to the bike fit on this one and um i'm not trying to plug myself <laughs> as, a bike, as a bike fitter on it you can totally do this stuff yourself for sure um but you can um somebody just getting somebody to kind of um even if it's a partner or friend just kind of having a look to kind of see like what your what your back's doing if you're really kind of rounded out at the bottom there um you can play around with a few things there on that one for sure so um for where it really kind of comes into play is that um if people are having lower back pain just like in general from like a from like a tension or positional sorts of stuff changing it um, change the tilt on the saddle there and to have an effect on lower back can make a big difference um, especially uh, for those who are finding that um, they are in a, a, a in an episode of an acute flare-up of their back pain um, and it's the type of pain that's really sensitive to any sort of like forward bending motion so whether it was like a disc injury or irritation or if they have any any kind of like nerve related pain like a sciatic sort of stuff um, and so what they want to do is you want to adjust the bike so that it's um, a little bit more upright just for the time being to reduce a bit of like that forwards bending so that it's definitely more tolerable because um, especially if you're on your bike a lot if you kind of keep um, 
aggravating it at, at, a, at a low level, um, then that can be a reason why symptoms kind of linger around. So if you can change some of that, it can definitely get things on a roll of clearing up. And sometimes it's a permanent adjustment, sometimes it's just temporary. So what I was talking about before with the neck pain, um, sometimes just doing a quick little switch up can, uh, um, so that, that you're a bit more upright to help symptoms resolve is great. And then if you want to go back to the position you were in before, that's totally fine too, as long as you're uh, monitoring symptoms and you're kind of gradually going back into that position instead of kind of slamming kind of right back into it. So sometimes it just needs a little bit of time to, to, work, its, to work its way out and get accustomed to that again. Um, and for people that are on the other end of the spectrum where they have um, more of a discomfort with uh, like bending backwards sorts of motion or extensions, so whether they have like a, um, a, like some arthritic changes in the lower back um, or some like facet joint sorts of pain that have pressure placed on them when you bend back, or if people are having stenosis, um, some stenotic changes in their lower back, and so that either can be um, like central stenosis, which is where the nerve kind of goes down center of the spine or you can have something called lateral stenosis or foraminal stenosis where um, the space around where the nerves exit from the back can be a bit um, can be a bit less so um, usually this is in an older population um, but uh, but however you cut it um, for cycling is definitely like a well actually tolerate position for this and and um, people um, I'm, I'm one of them and same with people's doctors there with it too is that they promote any kind of sort of like flex sorts of positions. So if you can, um, if you are in that position um, on, on your bike and it's comfortable, awesome. Take advantage of that. Get some good cardio in the mix there with the two because that can be really beneficial for lower back pain. Um, so, um, and that's what the research was kind of showing here. So they definitely, they're in, they're in support of that there with the two. So um, it can be provoking for some, but relieving for others. So <laughs> just depends on your situation there. Um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, um, um, again, just paying attention to what the, to what the body needs. Um, so another group um, from 2016, we're recommending, um, just like we talked about, um, if you're having a, a bout of back pain, um, changing up the hand position, as you can kind of see along the bottom here, does change the amount of bending forwards that you're doing there um, at, the, at the waist and therefore amount of flexion through the back. And, um, or you can do it this good as you can just <laughs> mix it up, prop your, prop your leg into the window of your support car to resolve a bit of a hamstring stretch if you need a bit of a position change um, and go about things that way. But I, I think most people don't have, <laughs> have those sorts of things in their, in their life at their disposal. So, um, but yeah, even just kind of stopping somewhere, um, just kind of, uh, this may not be the most feasible things, but uh, as an example, just kind of like, uh, yeah, getting off the bike and just, doing some opposite motions. So kind of talking about like we did with tucking in the chin, same sorts of things. You can do some backward bending there on it. Um, as long as you're in the group of people that isn't um, easily provoked by that motion. And you can do other stuff here with it too, where um, you can do like a, like an open book as an example exercise where you're kind of lying on your side and you're just kind of like opening up the shoulders and the chest, but you're also doing like a little bit of a, a stretch to the lower back there with the two and just kind of moving it. Um, in a slightly different position than it has been on the bike. So again, just getting, giving it some movement variability on that can be really good. Um, so for the, for going back to the to the to the group from 2010 there, um, so the 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 optimal position is one where you're kind of got a bit of hip flexion, hips are a bit tilted forwards, um, and there's less kind of bend bending on the on the spine, um, but few people if you really get into an aggressive sort of position can actually maintain this over time so um most of us don't sit in that position for any length of time there with it too so the research is just saying that um most people do vary up their positions which is good like we don't stay stuck in that position so don't don't be concerned about um being like oh my god i've been here for too long you've actually probably moved around a little bit there already but sometimes it just needs it a little bit more and being in that flex position is totally okay if it's not buggering you for sure. And so um, that's the word I was looking for. Jeez Louise, it was reach. <laughs> so yeah, so playing around with saddle angle or like how far obviously you're kind of stretched out um, was the other thing I couldn't think of earlier there with it. Um, again, that's the lack of sleep that's kind of popping up there. So sorry about that, guys. But um, but yeah, so we'll talk about we'll talk about that next. So. Um, so in addition to, like I said, like the angle of the saddle, um, 
we can talk about reach. So reach in this case is a bit different than what they would use uh, to, to for the term um, in terms of just um, uh, looking at the actual um, like um, oh, again, I guess I'm losing my words again here. Looking at the actual um, dimensions of the bike and the um, the uh, like the actual frame of the bike itself. So standard reach would be um, where you're going from like the bottom bracket to the to the middle of the head tube. Um, so that's what they would look at classically for that one with frame sizing and sizing of the bike. Here the researchers are talking about like how far you actually reach to hit the bars. And so uh, which is a which is a uh, important distinction to make. So yeah, if people were to if the reach wasn't very long, they're kind of a bit more bunched up. And again, that promotes that flexion through the back. Um, and uh, if you couple that too with a tilted seat, then that can be really quite uncomfortable for things as well. Um, but if you if you increase the reach in in this case, then you can actually again kind of bring it a little further forward and kind of flatten out the back. And um, um, then we go back to what we were talking about before: increase um, the comfort there by taking a bit of load and stretch off things. And uh, the other option you can do with it as well um, to, to create a longer reach is that either you can um, change the stem length, so you can make the stem length a little bit longer, so, so this guy right, right in through there. Um, you can actually move the saddle back as long as that doesn't um, cause any discomfort anywhere else, like in the hips or the knees. Or you can even kind of change like, the actual height of the bars there with the two. So if you, if you rotate the bars up a tiny bit, um, that'll, that'll shorten you if you feel like you're really stretched out. And if you rotate them down a little bit, it will um, effectively kind of lengthen the distance there between between you and the um, the rest of the bars there. So um, again, lots of little things you can try for that to make the back more comfortable. Um, geez, I feel like I'm being really kind of redundant here. So uh, I think we can probably go through this sort of stuff uh, quite quickly there. Yeah, I think I don't really need to talk about that a bit more, but this is just kind of giving you a rough idea um, in terms of just like um, pelvis position there with the two. So um, yeah, tips forwards, flatter, tips back, more rounded. That's how we're built and that's okay. <laughs> um, so, but there's some good news to all this sort of stuff. So um, it's, it's always good to kind of uh, put a silver lining on things there with the two. So um, this, so uh, Bellevue in 2019, um, uh, and the rest of their research team uh, were looking at potential risk factors for spinal pain. So like we were talking about, um, you can't always create a clear distinction uh, or association between the two, especially in the human body where we're pretty complex things. Um, so the, uh, um, it, it, they, they kind of compared, it was a small study though, so they compared 18 people that did quite a bit of cycling, so high volume kind of over the course of the week to people that were not super they call them non-sporting so i guess they, they were active but not on like a regular basis um and they were in kind of like a younger population um but they're all about the same height which is good because if you had um, that would just kind of change the 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 mechanics and um the setup of the bike in the study there so they tried to match their height on it there too and they actually uh, looked at mris between the spines of both groups um, and they found that the people that did do a lot of cycling um, had better or, or at least similar spinal muscle endurance. So it's not a case for being in that bent position, you're like you're harming yourself um, and you're making yourself weak because you stay there for, for too long. You're actually probably strengthening yourself to some extent on that one, just in a very specific position. So it was, it was no worse, it was better or similar. Um, they, had, they had a better quality psoas muscle. Um, so one of our hip flexors and by quality, I mean, it was a bit meatier and 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 stronger and thicker, and um, and it had um, um, less kind of like fatty deposits in there with it too. So um, which isn't which isn't a huge thing, but in terms of like quality of the muscle there, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, and they and but the best thing was that they had higher quality disc tissue, so the integrity of the lumbar disc was a lot better and um, had a better height to it, and it had better water content to it as well. So it was kind of like a um yeah a, a plumper healthier disc um which is good we need to highlight these sorts of things because um it's really easy for all of us to get um the the idea that um these sorts of positions are, are damaging and harming ourselves and going to create a disc fault and that sort of thing there with it too but if you if you load things up properly our bodies can adapt to pretty much anything that we throw at it as long as we give it the right conditions so this would be a prime example in this in this study group that 
um, are just actually um, like it for sure and can be, be really can be really beneficial and it can be uh, preventative for future stuff so heavy lifting that sort of thing too um, we can be nice and robust for sure and so uh, yeah so it's not in and of itself not detrimental to the spine and it might be uh, good beneficial changes for the back so yeah all good stuff so if we go to uh, kind of lower down the chain to the knee another really common spot like I was mentioning there um, uh, going back to the previous webinar we were talking a little bit about uh, pain at the knee because our, our knee kind of kind of wiggles around between our hip and our foot because uh, it's a bit more free floating in space so it just does what the uh, what the team does above and below it and so in the case of uh, in most cases if people are having some pain on the inside of their knee then you can adjust the foot um, inwards either with the cleat or just if you're on the flats position your foot inwards a little bit more um, and then I'll bring the knee out there a little bit to line things up a bit more and take a little bit of um, load or stress off the inside of the knee or we were talking about earlier in terms of like foot pressures you can even put if it's comfortable in the foot you can even put a bit of a, um, a wedge between the cleat and the shoe or um, in both cases if you're flats or clipped in putting a bit of a, um, an insole into the shoe there with a two and then on the other side for people riding a bit more knee out it's common for for those folks to get some discomfort on the outside of the knee so in this case you do the opposite you want to bring the foot outwards underneath it and so you can change the position of the of the cleat um, or you can move or you can move the foot out a little bit more if you're on the flats or in some cases you can even do for for either for either shoe type you can put a bit of a spacer in between the pedal and the uh, the crank arm to kind of widen the the base of support on it um, for these you really only kind of have two options either you can do um, a one and a half millimeter spacer or 20 centimeters so there's a bit of a jump with that but um, um, just based on um, kind of how things bolt together but uh, there is a couple options for that too if you don't want to do the insole uh, route or um, or if you're having difficulty positioning the foot um, those can be really helpful for people for sure yeah and unload the knee um, so if we're talking about inside knee pain outside knee pain um, a really common one is pain actually in the in the front of the knee and so this can be due to repetitive loading um, over time um, especially if the amount of loading greatly exceeds the speed in which your kind of tissues and like whether it's the ligaments or the muscles that sort of thing are able to kind of regenerate or adapt to the load that you're placing on them so this can come about if there's like a quick sudden change in your routine excuse me in your routine so doing a lot more hills or if you decide to kind of go at like a faster speed on your rides um, quite abruptly or if you're increasing the frequency of how many rides you're doing uh, within a week so um, usually there's some kind of yeah some kind of jump that loads things extra and then if you kind of keep loading that over time it might start to get a bit uncomfortable there for you um, it can also be due to a traumatic event as well obviously like you can um, you can fall onto your knee um, or you can be involved in like a road collision and that sort of stuff which would be more on the traumatic traumatic end of things um, obviously but um, it is common to be more of like a like a repetitive sort of issue and so um, what usually results in either case is that now either the quads tendon itself or your kneecap or the the tendon your patellar tendon between the kneecap and the top of your shin have now become like load or pressure sensitive and we need to start addressing that so um and we can we can we can address that by um um doing um, what we were kind of talking about before in terms of changing like saddle height and that sort of thing and um and we'll touch on that in a second but um there was some research that actually just came out really recently as you can see it's 2020 where it, um this is kind of anecdotal but just something worth you know, interesting worth noting is that um they always used to think like oh yeah standing up is probably just easier on the knees to kind of go uphill but nobody really studied it these guys actually studied it and they did find that um, if you stand up you create less power through the knee by up to about 15 percent with going up hills um, and you just make more of the work happen at the ankle and, and the and the hip muscles so again sharing the load to somewhere else maybe we could use this as a strategy to help out people in terms of trying to decrease the load um, on their knee um, during that recovery phase there with the two so um, that was a little something that I found kind of interesting that just kind of popped up in one of the cycling magazines there um, but yeah yeah another kind of strategy to it 
so um, for for this group from 2018, um, again, in terms of like trying to predict pain, just like the back can be kind of tricky. This group found that um, for people that have knee pain in general, and this can be like a kind of have in boulder, it can be pain really anywhere. The commonalities were that the people's knees were kind of um, kind of adducted or kind of coming in a little bit inwards or kind of that knee, knock knee sort of position. And the amount of angle they had between their shin and their foot was usually a bit higher there with it as well. So um, a couple of things there were kind of um, common in people that had pain, um, but it wasn't, um, again, you can't really kind of correlate with, between the two like really strongly there. So um, these are just commonalities. And so, um, yeah, they found it. They're unsure of what that meant, particularly <laughs> the case with research, um, but uh, it was just some things they found uh, there with people. And so we wanna take that sort of stuff into consideration. Um, as we're fitting people and 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 uh, trying to help alleviate pain. Um, on the flip side, they found uh, another group back in 2018 found that, um, which can be common with uh, um, some of the pain around the knee is that uh, if you do have a larger angle um, kind of here, it can be because the seat's too low or the seat's too far forwards and that's putting the knee kind of past over top of the toes. Um, this group found that actually they were noticing pain in people more so if they actually went in the other direction. So if they actually moved the seat back too far, that would increase pain through through the knee joint there with the two as opposed to going too far forwards. So um, there was no increased uh, pressure on with with the with this with the seat too far forwards or or more of a knee past the toe position. They actually didn't find any increased pressures around the kneecap, which is the patellofemoral joint or um, the actual knee joint itself, so between the tibia and the, and, uh, the femur, um, which is kind of interesting there with it. So again, I put kind of a thinking face of what does that mean? You're just gonna have to make it work, make it work for the person. Um, sometimes there isn't a clear cut rule on these sorts of things, but uh, we just wanna make sure obviously the changes that we make and the, and the changes that you make to yourself are, are meaningful and making a difference. And sometimes um, you just have to play around with things and that's the, that's the art of it all. Yeah, so this was a quick um, summary, um, and this will be included in the in the slides in the handout there for the uh, um, for the for the Bike to Work Society's uh, uh, resource database. Um, so don't, we won't, won't be kind of spending really any kind of time this with it right now, but you'll have a bit of like a summary in terms of like some possible contributing factors to different sorts of knee pain, and I might throw in a different one that has um, was missing a column here from from one of the papers about. Uh, what you can do to to adjust it for sure and um so i'll make sure that's in the mix and then like i said for the traumatic injuries wasn't really going to touch too much on this but the common ones on this one would be um you know a collarbone fractures or a shoulder injury from a from a fall radial head fractures which would be um the fracture kind of like up in the arm bone through here from putting the arm out again during a fall or the fractures of the ribs or in, in some cases there too um to uh, having a concussion. So um, again, super big topic, very individualized. So I wasn't gonna touch on that, but, the, but those are um, just something that I kind of wanted to mention as, as some common ones here with the two um, and all, all totally treatable for sure. Um, good. And so in terms of like a quick point about just some pain um, in general, um, the solution, <laughs> um, so the common theme is obviously sharing, sharing the load, spreading the pressure around to kind of help out help out different areas of the body there so they feel better as you're moving. But the other big part of it too is just variation of movement. So there's been multiple studies out there that have shown that people with longstanding like persistence or chronic pain tend to have reduced movement variability and they get a bit trapped or stuck into moving a certain way in the same way over and over again over time. And so if you kind of can give people some variety of movements, strengthen up some other muscle groups, have them doing some mobility exercise in just completely different directions, than those that mimic bike positions or anything else in their day um, can be really kind of beneficial um, for both the brain and the body there itself there with it too. So um, variation is key, just like variation of hand position on the bars um, for sure. And so, yeah, the main thing is that, um, yeah, variety is, variety is the spice of life and it gives it all its flavor. And so and that's totally true with this sort of stuff. So just kind of keep mixing it up, keeping active in much different, uh, much different methods. And, uh, and that'll be, that'll be great. So yeah, so like I said, for the exercise stuff, 
maybe we'll leave that to another one. But uh, um, I just wanted to kind of throw my contact information out there with the two. And again, I can, I'll add that into the uh, to the resource database there with the two, so you'll have it. But uh, um, that's that's my Instagram stuff. I'm emailed there with the two. So yeah, totally free to get in touch with me anytime you want if you need. For sure. So thanks for your thanks for your time, everybody. And um, oops, had Justine on there <laughs> and James <laughs> for uh, uh, everybody there at the Bike to Work Society. That's great. Thanks thanks so much for having me um, on the webinar there again. Um, that was that was really good. And I realized that I totally used up the whole hour. And there's probably not much time for the question and answer period. Oh, that's all right. Thanks but, so much. Man. That was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like yeah. I'm Perched, but yeah, but it's, but it's good. Yeah, there's a lot of information there, but um, yeah, glad you liked it. That was great, thanks. Yeah, I'll leave, I'll do two quick plugs before we move into the Q&A. One sure. for our uh, next cycling courses, in-person cycling courses or hybrid courses that are coming up on August 8th and 9th, and then August 22nd and 23rd, two adult courses, which combine online and in-person on bike. Uh, activities, which you can find on our website and on our social media. We'll be advertising those soon. And also you can find Evan at the contact info he just mentioned, and also at docsidephysio.com, where you can see services they offer, like bike fitting, which might be of great interest to some people. Uh, and we just have two questions so far that I see. The first one being, do, 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 do. Oh, um, can you speak to numbness or tingling while wearing uh, clip-in shoes on the top of the foot as opposed to the bottom of the foot, and what might be causing that? Yeah, so that's a good question for sure, and um, yeah, that's that's one that's that's one where um, usually that kind of comes about from like the um, from the from the fitting of the shoe, um, and so if yeah, if people are, are, are riding a shoe um, that's a bit kind of too snug for them, and I can kind of put compression all the way around it. Um, sometimes it's the, um, shape of the, the tongue of the shoe itself can have some funny points or some pressure points in there too. So, um, you could try actually putting like a bit of like a thin piece of foam, um, or that sort of stuff just between the top of the shoe and your foot just to, um, still make your foot kind of steady in the shoe, but just take a little bit of like pressure point paint off it and see if that, see if that makes a difference. Or on the flip side, if your shoe's too big and you're kind of sloshing around inside of it, something that can put a bit of rub on things or with it as well. So um, that'd be something that you could you could try with that. Um, that'd be the simplest one. I mean, sometimes people can get pain in the top of their foot referring from their back. So um, if you're if you're nice noticing a bit of kind of back pain in conjunction with that, um, that might be worthwhile to get that kind of checked out for sure. Um, and see if there's anything associated with that. But um, I probably I probably kind of start with this like the shoe setup on that one for starters for sure. Yeah. Awesome. And our other question. Oh, actually, this there's one that's not a question, but someone else recommending getting a professional bike fit that it's saying that it really helped them. So there okay. you go. Awesome. Awesome. And the other one is um, my boyfriend and I rode up to Thetis and he complained about a sore saddle, though not his words. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, is it possible his seat's too high trying to trouble, troubleshoot issues with a sore saddle? Oh, so, so the engine, the, the seat was too high? Yeah, they're asking, is it possible the seat was too high? Uh, they're trying to troubleshoot issues that might cause a sore saddle. For sure, yeah. So, um, so going back to um kind of near i guess the beginning of the, of the webinar there yeah so it, it can be um totally can be that the seat's too high um so people can kind of be rocking on the saddle a bit more because they're really trying to reach for the pedals there with it and that can put an extra rub on things down there and uh cause some soreness with that and so definitely lowering the seat a little bit would be would be beneficial for that one um or if, yeah if again if the saddle's too narrow or it's not the right um the right sizing you can try that cardboard um, trick I was mentioning about there with the two and seeing if a better saddle would be an option or playing around with like the amount of kind of tilt kind of um, forwards or not so much bringing it up but kind of um, change the angle on it there with the two and some people are too far forwards and they slide onto the nose of it and that makes it sore but um, just making sure that, that that's the right angle there on it too and um, and again yeah I, I don't know who asked the question there but if, if you want to send me an email I can I can uh, um, fire you back something with some options there for it too and, and talk about some knee angles you can try out um, to troubleshoot. 
Awesome. And one final question. Uh, you mentioned that relaxing tension in the upper body can help with neck pain. Would this also be helpful for chronic elbow pain while cycling? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if, um, I, oh, well, again, it depends on where it's kind of coming from. So if, um, if people are riding kind of locked out, it doesn't always happen this way, but sometimes if people are kind of locked out, if they are kind of shrugged up a bit, usually like they're kind of, they can sometimes be squeezing quite hard without <laughs> realizing it, like onto their bars. So that's a lot of like forearm kind of muscle um, tension through there. So sometimes relaxing the hands can decrease some of the, some of the tension in the muscles and that can help. Um, if it's, if it's pain, um, if you're getting pain with like full elbow extension, I can't get into the screen here to real doing full elbow extension, like in that sort of position, like that's uncomfortable to be, um, uh, where they call it like closed packs or where the bones are kind of fully in contact with each other. Um, definitely riding a bit more relaxed to the arms can, um, can take you out of that position and make it a bit more comfortable. But, um, yeah, I'd say, I mean, it's definitely worth a try, uh, for sure. It can definitely be a help for people. So I'd give that a whirl. Yeah. Awesome. And I think that's all we have time for, except someone else giving you praise in the question. Thanks for providing, um, thanks for providing free advice to some cyclists and making yeah. this stuff accessible. And I yeah. see someone else, or there's a couple more questions, but unfortunately we don't really have time to get to those. So I encourage you to send an email to Evan. And Evan, can you remind them your email? Yeah, so it's just, so it's just my name. So it's evan at docsidephysio.com. Um, I mean, you could, yeah, I mean, if you want to send us a message through Instagram to um, mine's the bike physio and our, our clinic's just Dockside Physio, so that'd be the other option there too with it as well. Or, or if you want, James, you can, if you have their contact information there, if you, if you guys are consent to that, <laughs> then you can send it to me that way with it too, if that's, if that's easier. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Evan. And thank you everyone for attending. Yeah. And Evan, I'm sure we'll see you for another webinar in the future. Sounds good, man. For sure. All right. <laughs> Great. Okay. Take care, guys. Thanks.